In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, aside from Jesus himself, St. Paul is probably the most influential person in the New Testament. He is the author of the earliest books that we have in the New Testament. His writings predate the Gospels even. And his missionary travels changed the religious landscape of the world and quite probably altered the course of history. St. Paul can be kind of hard to read sometimes though, can't he? To paraphrase Marcus Borg, Paul is sometimes appealing but sometimes kind of appalling. Now, regardless of where you fall on that scale, we pretty much have to deal with Paul. He's just too important to ignore. I find him more appealing than appalling in this particular passage of scripture from Acts today. And there are a couple of things in particular that I'm drawn to. One is that Paul deals head on with the problems of idolatry that he finds in Athens. Now, to be fair, the Athenians don't believe that they're committing idolatry. They're kind of blind to it until Paul points it out. But Paul deals particularly with that altar to the unknown God. Now, you may know this, but in pagan religions, they didn't so much worship one God as a bunch of different local gods. And the point was to appease them so that the gods wouldn't wreak havoc on their villages or cause them trouble. So they would build shrines and altars to different gods in hopes that that would partly help to appease them. Now, every now and again, they're afraid that maybe they missed somebody. Hence the altar to the unknown god, just to play it safe. It's kind of like if you or I said, well, I'm not superstitious but I'll maybe keep my fingers crossed or not, you know, cross in the path of a black cat just in case. What Paul says to them is basically, you worship images formed by art and imagination, but I want to introduce you to the living God. Well, Paul introduces the Athenians and us, and the Gospels introduce us to the same living God, and yet we are still prone to worship idols, aren't we? Wonder what our idols are. What are our national idols? What do we value more than Jesus's commandments to love one another and to seek first the kingdom of God? Whatever we prioritize more than this, Well, those are probably our national idols. Maybe you can relate to having a personal idol or two. And remember, we're likely to be like the Athenians, blind to the fact that we even have them. When you're in trouble, who do you turn to first? If it isn't God, it might be one of your idols. When something goes right in your life, to whom or what do you give the credit? If it isn't God, it might be one of your idols. The bad news is that we are especially prone to seeking after idols, to running after false god. But the good news is, and this is Paul's point to the Athenians, that same instinct that sends us running after idols is at the core our desire for God, the living God who was revealed to us in Jesus. We don't need to get rid of those desires or those instincts. We just need to correctly identify what we're really hungering for. And indeed, as Paul says, we are not, or God is not far from each of us. If we seek God, when we seek God, we will find God. Well, another thing that is appealing to me about Paul is just his very presence in Athens. And I'll tell you a couple reasons why that is. My first trip overseas was to Greece. 
My best friend and I were in Athens, and we were recent seminary grads and also kind of nerdy. And so we were excited to go to Mars Hill, also known as the Areopagus or Areopagus. And we wanted to get a, a picture pretending to preach from that hill. Now, it was a cool experience to stand in the same place that such a giant of our faith, maybe the one really responsible for propagating Christianity, used to stand. But to get the most out of the experience, we had to pretend not to know that Paul's mission to the Athenians was really not all that successful. If you read further on in that 17th chapter of Acts, the author notes that some joined him and became believers. But by most standards, and certainly by the, rest of, the standards of the rest of Paul's missionary trips, the effort was really kind of a bust. He gained only a few converts, and he did not establish a community there. Now, from what we know of Paul through the book of Acts and also his letters, we might describe Paul as determined, or maybe stubborn, committed, and also somewhat, well, he had a healthy ego anyway. And while this can make him tough to read, appalling to use Marcus Borg's words, it also gives him that kind of tenacity to just keep moving on and keeping at it. And it's a good thing, really, because one could imagine Paul in a different instance saying, you know what? Maybe this missionary thing just really isn't my deal. This was relatively early on in his ministry. Scholars think that it happened around the year 51, and yet he continued to travel for some 10 to 15 years after this. Can you think of what the world would be like if Paul had just given up? Now, this is now holy conjecture. I think that's my microphone, so I'll just use this one. This is now holy conjecture, since the text is silent about what Paul was actually thinking and feeling during this time. But I'd like to think that when it didn't go as he had hoped in Athens, that Paul was able to learn from the experience. And not only that, but to narrow his sense of purpose and mission. Even if he hadn't given up, another course that Paul might have taken was just to continue the effort, to press on and try to force something that wasn't flowing naturally, and at the expense of starting other missions or of continuing to nurture and pastor those churches that he already established. The author of Acts tells us that Paul left Athens and went straight to Corinth. If he had persisted in Athens, we might never have had those beautiful letters to the Corinthians. We might never have had that beautiful passage, love is patient, love is kind some of the best of what Paul has to offer. You know, in our culture, most of us are averse to failure. But sometimes what we perceive as failure is really a holy repurposing. Maybe you know the story about a boy who went outside with a ball and a baseball bat to practice his hitting. You might actually know it as a Kenny Rogers song. But he says, I am the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws the ball up, and he takes a swing, and he misses. And he announces, strike one. Well, he repeats this two more times, effectively striking himself out. And then he paused and said, wow, I am the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> Sometimes it's just about repurposing what you're about. And maybe you're dealing with something now, or have dealt with something in the past, that you considered a failure. But what, it, but what if it is, or what if it was, just the spirit moving in your life, leading you toward a repurposing, 
leading you toward a new mission. Whatever idols we create, whatever failures or even successes that we have in our stories, that's not what is permanent about us. That's not what makes us who we are. We might mistake our idols for God, but they are not God. The one thing that is permanent about our identity is our relationship with Jesus. We are his offspring, Paul tells the Athenians. Or as Jesus tells those scared disciples huddled together in the gospel as he is preparing to leave them, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you, and because I live, you also will live. We are first, foremost, and most importantly, beloved children of God. Can you embrace that? Can you embrace that status of being in God's family, of being a beloved child? And can you let go of your idols and your perceived failures and just live in that truth today? You are a beloved child of God. Amen.